So we'll get into it. Um, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. We went through with the, with the team. Uh, Brett and I talked a lot about the different things we're going to cover. Um, it is going to be pretty much all technical one way or another. Um, but like I said, just remember sales, having communicating with the client about uh, offerings, making sure you collect, that is what pays for the technical part of the trade. It really is. And it's not that one is more important than the other. They're both important. In residential, you've got to be really good at doing your job fundamentally, uh, and you also have to make sure that the business survives and that the bills get paid and all that. So it is both. I've always been the technician who fought that side, the sales side, the business side. I would always complain about it. I never loved collecting. Um, but as I've you know, expanded in my career, I've realized you really have to respect that part of it and you need to make sure you do that part and you take that part really seriously. Um, and now I'm the owner who has to have those conversations with my technicians. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of giving you both here to say I understand. I understand most of us got into the trade or enjoy the trade because we like fixing things. We like solving problems. We like doing a good looking install. We like doing it efficiently. We like uh, seeing that outcome, and that's really important. So we are gonna, we, that's what we're gonna talk about in this class. We're gonna start with something really, really, really fundamental, which is bracing. Now, when you're working on ductless systems, obviously you don't do, you don't brace, or at least very rarely are you gonna brace. Um, a lot of you have probably seen issues with expansion valves. Electronic expansion valves, TXVs, um, they fail on you. And sometimes that is, especially in this market, it may be due to salt air. Sometimes you'll get uh, the old school power heads will rust out and they'll leak the, leak the charge and that kind of thing. But a lot of it has to do with proper brazing practices in the first place. So what are some of the main goals? I'm just going to pick on some of you here. So I'm just going to point. So get ready. It's OK. What are some of the main issues that you find that come from improper brazing? And I'm going to start with Kieran. Clog metering devices, that's a, that's a really common one. Uh, what else? What's that? Damage compressors. Because again, the problem with damage compressors, here's an old timer line. And again, okay, I was trained by guys uh, who did things the old school way. They didn't use any digital tools. It was all analog gauges and all that. And I'm going to give you a quick, a quick uh, insider view of me. When I charge the air conditioner at my house, I still use analog gauges. Like I don't. I, don't, I still prefer that method. But a lot of what we do nowadays is stuff that we've learned as equipment has developed and evolved, right? So, so I'm, I'm not saying when I, when I, sometimes it's gonna sound like I'm picking on old timers, I'm not. I, I am in many ways, I have a lot of that same stuff. I was trained by a lot of those same people. But when you say failed compressor or damaged compressor, You'll get a lot of old timers who will say, look, I haven't flowed nitrogen while brazing my whole career, and it nev I never had a problem, right? I've never pulled a vacuum my whole career, and I never had a problem. Well, you don't know if you ever had a problem, right? It's not like if you don't pull a vacuum or if you don't flow nitrogen while you're brazing. It's not like the compressor explodes in three days, you know, and, and holds up a flag that says, I failed because you brazed improperly. It doesn't tell you, right? It just breaks. And so... Four years down the road, a compressor fails, and you don't know why it failed. And what do people usually blame? What's the number one thing that gets blamed? Maybe that's not true in this market, but in our market. Factory and lightning. There you go. Those are the two. Oh, man, they don't make these things like they used to make them. And they'll blame lightning. Well, I mean, again, is it lightning sometimes? Uh, maybe. Is it the utility sometimes? Maybe. But in most cases, it's not. In most cases, it's improper installation practices. Okay. So another quick thing. What's a big thing that changed back when we moved from R22 to R410A? There's a really big thing that changed in air conditioning at that time. The oil changed, right? And we changed from what to what? Anybody know? What was the old oil? Mineral oil, right? Good old mineral oil, right? Mineral oil, that is just, I mean, that's great stuff. Like, you have, a, you have a sore on your arm, you can rub mineral oil on it, right? But for balding, you know, mineral oil. It's, it's great for everything. It's amazing. What's the problem with mineral oil? Why did we go away from mineral oil? What's the issue with it? What's that? Burns. Burns, can, yeah, can. There's one main reason that we went away from mineral oil. Say that again. It absorbs moisture. Well, no, actually, mineral oil doesn't absorb moisture. That's what's different about it. 
So mineral oil had a lot of great properties. It was not hygroscopic. That's a fancy word. It just means that it doesn't attract moisture. It doesn't hold it. It doesn't mix with the refrigerant as well. It's not carried through the system as well. That's the problem. And when we had the old refrigerants, R22, R12, all those, they had a special molecule in there. And that special molecule helped move that mineral oil through the system. Does anybody know what that special molecule was that we did away with? Chlorine, there you go. Good stuff, chlorine. So that chlorine is what helped carry that through the system. We took away the chlorine, mineral oil didn't carry as well as it used to. So now we had to switch oils and we went to PoE. PoE is a very good lubricant. There's nothing wrong with PoE. The problem is, is that you expose it to any moisture whatsoever and not only does it absorb the moisture, but it turns into an acid once it absorbs the moisture, right? But there's another thing about PoE that people forget because old timers will say, I never flowed nitrogen my whole life. I never even considered doing it. Why is this all of a sudden a problem? That's because when you cut open the tubes, on a mineral oil system, if you've ever cut open the copper on an old system that only had mineral oil in it its whole life, and you look inside, you'll often still see that black stuff inside the pipe. That's cupric oxide, okay? That's like rust of copper. It's like what rust is to steel, cupric oxide is to copper. It actually comes off of the copper. And you've all seen that black flicky stuff, right? Whenever you're brazing. It's on the outside, and if you don't flow nitrogen while you're brazing, it's also on the inside. And with a mineral oil system, that just stayed there for its whole life mostly, unless it was real bad. Some of it, a little bit would flake off, but it would just hang out there because the mineral oil didn't pull it off. POE oil scrubs it, scrubs it clean, okay? Anybody who ever worked in, anybody here ever work in like grocery store refrigeration, any really big refrigeration systems? Okay, in really big refrigeration, they've done a lot of gas changes where you went from one gas to another gas and you'd have this old store that had mineral oil in it and an old refrigerant. You'd be like, all right, we're gonna change it, we're gonna pull the old oil out, we're gonna put POE in it, the new oil, right? Well, what would happen is they would put the new oil in and immediately all of the strainers and all of the expansion valves, all the metering devices and the whole store will clog. So that proves what POE does, right? It runs through there and it just pulls all of that cupric oxide off the walls. So this is why old timers used to get away with murder when it came to brazing because with vacuum of brazing because the old oil didn't mind moisture too much. It wasn't good for it, but it didn't mind moisture too much. And it also didn't scrub the walls of the cupric oxide. Nowadays, we have an oil that when it gets moisture and it, it actually turns into an acid. It just starts eating away everything inside the system. And it scrubs the walls of all that, of all that cupric oxide. So we just can't get away with what we used to get away with. Now again, why is that? Well, there's lots of, lots of reasons why they made these changes, but POE, if you follow proper practices, is a great lubricant. Same thing with PV, which is used in a lot of ductless systems, polyvinyl ether. Great lubricants. They do a really good job, so long as they're not exposed to air, oxygen, moisture, and so long as the lines are clean to begin with. That makes sense? So I like to level set that to understand, because you're going to have these voices ringing in your head. Like if you came from a, those guys weren't wrong. They weren't wrong in the world that they lived in. But now in the world we live in, we can't just keep doing the same thing. Otherwise, you're going to run into problems that they never had. That makes sense? So it is important. I was one of the guys. I'll tell you what I used to say when guys would tell me about flowing nitrogen while brazing. I would, first of all, I'd make jokes. I would say brazing with nitrogen doesn't work. It doesn't catch on fire. You know, when you're brazing, see, that's a joke, guys. It's a really stupid sense of humor. Nitrogen doesn't catch on fire. Okay, that, was, that didn't land. We'll try again next time. Uh, and the other thing that I would say is that's overkill. Come on now. Do you really got to do that? That's overkill. That's not necessary. Until I ran a company where we all of a sudden started having all these issues and I realized, okay, we actually do need to follow these practices and it did reduce callbacks. But even more importantly than callbacks, it extended the lives of the systems that we're installing. So now they're not failing within the warranty period. Because I can tell you, Shay and Brett, they don't want compressors to fail within the warranty period. That's not good for business. What's good for business is when you install a system and it lives a nice long life and fails at exactly 10 years so you can install the next one, right? That's what we want to do. All right. Um, some other things real quick. Um, deburring. Who here uh, deburs copper when you're, before you connect the fittings? You take the little thing and you take the burr off the edge. Now don't lie to me, okay, because I, I'll, I'll know. I can see it in your eyes. It's very rare that people do that. So deburring is a good practice. Why? Is 
Right, it does. It reduces restriction of the refrigerant flow, right? Now, if you have two connections on both sides of a line set and that's it, does that make a big difference? The answer is not really. Like, is failing to deburr going to be a big issue for a typical change out with a 20 foot line set and two connections on both sides? Not, not a huge difference. But the problem is, is that if you don't practice it, then when it does matter, you're going to forget to do it. Right? That's the issue with practices. It's like either you do it or you don't do it. Now, what's the downside with deburring? Because there's a significant downside. Yeah, you can drop the burr in the pipe, right? And so what's more valuable? If you're going to deburr it and you're going to risk dropping the burr in the pipe, then don't deburr it, right? So if you've got a, you got a, you got a tube sticking straight up and there's no real way, don't, don't do it. Guys will give all these things. It's like, well, uh, sometimes I stick a piece of electrical tape down in there and then I pull it. It's like, uh, uh, no, just, just leave it be, right? It's OK. One little burr is not going to kill anything. But if you work in a system where you've got multiple connections over a long run and whatever, it can make a pretty significant difference. Because what happens? On the other side of that burr, it runs through. There's this little, it goes in, it creates all this turbulence in the line. It also increases the odds that that connection is going to leak over time if it's not a great connection, which is kind of a side note. But you get a lot more internal friction. And so it's a lot more likely that that, that, that joint is going to leak eventually. Again, if you're working in spaces like grocery store refrigeration, like we do a lot of, that is really important. And residential, not as big of a deal. But here's a quick uh, hack that you can do that, that eliminates both. And I learned this from my buddy Joe Shearer, um, who's done a lot with us, live streams and all that. He doesn't use a typical deburring tool in residential. He just takes needle nose pliers, just does that, right? And so it's a little bit of a different strategy, but it actually works fine. Because now, rather than removing the burr, it's just smashing the burr flat. That's all it's doing. And, for big stuff, that probably wouldn't be the best bet. And if you had really big piping, a needle nose wouldn't work anyway. But in residential, that's just as easy. Often it's easier in the, in the pocket. So again, stuff like this that I'm telling you, you still got to check with your leadership to make sure that's OK. But that is my, that is my go-to. Matt? Let me just say something off of that. Make sure your needle nose pliers are at least somewhat clean when you do that. Like <laughs> yes, yes, you yes. You know, off of the unit or something, or they're covered in dirt. Do you guys use like a swedging tool to expand the copper? Yeah. Uh, if, you de if you don't use a deburring tool, especially on the really small copper, uh, you get a lot more splitting yeah. with, when, when you're sweating. Again, if you deburr properly, and that's a really important thing, right? A lot of times you hand an apprentice a deburring tool, and what do they tend to do with it? Oh, they just keep going, man. They just, and what happens then? Well, it thins the edge off really thin, and then it splits. And especially if you're making a flare, that's no bueno. So, and, and that's actually a really key point that you're making. Flaring and swedging, it does become more important, right? And even, and again, depending on the way you do flaring, there are a lot of different ways you can flare. Some people use like the spin flare. And when you use that, then the deburring is not as important because it kind of does it for you when you do it. Um, but for most flaring, doing a good deburr, and, and again, I'm a fan of people learning how to do it the right way anyway, because it's just, it's just good to know. Um, hacks are good, like the needle nose thing when you're, you know, again, you're, you've done it a lot. You already know how to do it, but it's just a quicker way, a better way in a lot of cases, a less risky way. Again, because I'm always, I'm really always afraid of people dropping burrs in the tube. That, that's a much worse problem for the equipment. Now, again, if you have a line dryer and it's properly positioned, then even that's not the end of the world. But uh, good best practices are key here. A couple other things here, and again, we're, we're going to, a lot of this is, you know, because we're going to cover some of this again when we're just talking to the apprentices, but I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, one of the worst things that you see an apprentice do when they're brazing is they're doing, they're so afraid, right? So they're going in and out, they're, they're just, oh man, I'm going to burn a hole in it. They're so terrified of burning a hole in it, and they move the torch around way too much, so much motion, you know, it's like, what is going on here? The biggest thing for newer people in using a torch is just get it to the proper temperature, and we're going to show, we're going to show a picture here of what you're looking for, but just get it to the proper temperature. A lot of people will talk about damaging copper by getting it too hot. How do you know when you've damaged copper by getting it too hot? Anybody know? Because it blows a big hole in it. That's how you know. So it's very clear when that happens, right? And so you don't want to get it close to that because that's risky. You might blow a hole in it. But I'll hear some people say, oh, man, look at that joint. They really burned it up. You can't burn up a connection. It's either melted or it's not melted. You can burn up a valve, right? So anything that has any sort of O-rings or um, seals in it, that kind of thing, you can burn up those very easily. But you can't burn up a joint. A joint is either melted or it's not melted. 
Uh, and for what we do, and again, because you'll get people in some of the more advanced parts of the building, well, it, you know, it, it causes the, the copper to be softened and all this stuff. In residential, that is not a thing. That is not, just get it to temperature, get the solder pulled in there, and move on. The other thing is, and this is going to become big because you guys probably already are seeing more flammable refrigerant. Um, you guys, have you had any R32 uh, equipment come through yet? Uh, you're going to. Because again, 410A is going away in the US and through a lot of the other countries. And so you're going to start getting R32 uh, and what is it, 454B? 454B. Uh, those are both mildly flammable refrigerants. We're going to talk about, a little bit about that. But this makes it more important than ever for you to cut your uh, connections and not unsweat them, right? Because you've all seen this happen before where you're unsweating and it kind of does that poof back in your face when you're in the process of unsweating. Um, this is partially because we've been told that 410A is non-flammable, right? If you've all heard that, right? 410A is non-flammable. But if you ever put a torch straight on 410A in small amounts, you'll get that little poof, right? It is flammable. It's just not very flammable. The new refrigerants are just slightly more flammable. So it'd be a little bigger poof. Again, we want to keep our eyebrows. So, you know, we look a lot better with them than without them in most cases. Uh, so we want to cut out uh, the, the, when, we're, when we're making repairs rather than unsweat as much as possible, okay? That is a best practice and is going to continue to advance as you work with more and more flammable refrigerants. I can almost assure you that there's going to come a day in our trade, not in the not too far future, where refrigerants like propane and isobutane are going to be in residential equipment. That's when it becomes even a lot more important. So cutting out rather than unsweating. There's another reason why you want to cut out rather than unsweat, specifically line dryers. Do you know why? Drives it, right. So it's a desiccant base. It absorbs that moisture. And when you heat it, it forces that moisture back out, right? So that line dryer did all this work to catch all that moisture. And if you start heating it up, you're going to drive that moisture back out. All right. I think I've hit all the, I think I've hit all the main things. All right. Quick, quick fact here. We're going to just go over some really quick brazing science that most people don't ever get taught. And I didn't get taught until probably five years ago. Why do we want to use, so, so you, you know when you're lighting, everybody here use, uh, actually I need to establish this first, oxacetylene torch, is that what you mostly use? Or do you, oxacetylene, okay, good. So you have this secondary feather, you're right, when you're adjusting a torch you got the little flame and then you got that secondary feather and then you got the long feather, right? Okay, so why do we want to have a little bit of a secondary feather instead of having a little, little tiny blue flame? Does anybody know? Um, that, um, small flame. You're right, it's like more like a cutting flame, right? Yeah, you're right, you're right, that is true. But the other reason is, is that, so this is the name for these things. So you have oxidizing flame, which means you have more oxygen than acetylene in the flame. Okay, you have a neutral flame, which means you have balanced oxygen acetylene, and you have a carburizing flame, which means that you have slightly more acetylene, okay? Here's why you don't want to use an oxidizing flame primarily. And that is that an oxidizing flame has an excess of oxygen. When you have cupric oxide, copper oxide, that black stuff that shows up, what is that? A lot of people believe it's soot. That's not what I thought. I thought it was soot. Because you know, sometimes when you light your torch and you start with an only acetylene flame and you light it and you get those, you get that soot. I thought that was the same thing. I thought the birds were the same thing that was ending up in the copper. Because it kind of looks the same, right? Well, it's not. Those birds are soot from a completely acetylene flame. That black stuff that shows up on the copper is copper oxide. It's like rust of copper. And what does oxide sound like? Oxide sounds like oxygen, right? And so what happens? It's heat, it's oxygen, and it's copper together. When you get those three things together, that's what causes copper oxide. And it happens, if I remember correctly, I think it's at over 900 degrees. I think it's, I think it's 900 ish degrees. That's where you start to build up copper oxide. But if you have excess oxygen in your flame, what are you doing to that chemical reaction? You're, you're boosting it, right? You're adding extra oxygen, and so you're going to be more likely to get more oxide build up when you're using that extra oxygen. Which, what does that do when you're trying to braze? Because what are you doing? What's a brazing rod made of? Anybody know? Generally, copper, phosphorus, phos copper, 
And then you sometimes, depending on the brazing rods you use, a little bit of silver. So if you've seen like Silfos 5, Silfos 10, Silfos 15, that's the percentage of silver, right? The phosphorus acts as a fluxing agent. You've all heard of flux before, right? And you know you don't have to use flux when you're brazing copper to copper. We don't in residential, we don't use flux. Well, why the flux not? It's because you don't, see that was another little joke real quick. I just, I, I slipped that in. If you don't laugh, then I'm gonna get self-conscious. So even if it's fake, just laugh. <laughs> uh, there you go, I, I like it, I like it, I like it. So the phosphorus in that rod acts as the fluxing agent, right? The problem is, is that if you have excess oxygen, and it starts building up these oxides, it interferes with that, and you will get weaker joints. And it won't flow as well. So, for those of you who haven't done it, what you want to do is you want to adjust to a neutral flame. You want to get it to where it just, you get that feather, and then you just get it down to where it's perfectly balanced, and then go a little bit up. So you just have a little tiny bit of a secondary flame. Now again, that doesn't tell you how big your flame is. You can adjust it bigger or smaller. The way you should do that is at the actual regulators, not at the handles. So if you set the regulators and you jack them way up, and now you're doing it all at the handle, the problem with this is, because I'll get a lot of guys ask, why? Why does that matter? The problem is, is that now you bump the handle even a little bit, and the flame goes crazy on you, right? If you get the regulators adjusted, and some people will say, oh, 10 and 10, 7 11, 5 and 5. Who really cares that much? I mean, it's not that big of a deal because you're still going to make some fine adjustments at the handles. Those gauges aren't that accurate anyway, especially if they've been banging around in your truck for that long. But you want to get them close so that that way, when you are adjusting, there's more handle motion, right? So you have a little bit more play. If you've got them jacked way up, you just take a, it's, it's always jumping around on you, right? So you make those fine adjustments at the handle, and now you get that thing where it's just slightly carburizing, just slightly. It's going to make a stronger joint. Initially, you're going to be annoyed by it because it's like, man, that's a bigger flame, right? Especially if you're used to using that tiny little, that tiny little flame like that. But again, just now, just adjust the, adjust your regulators down. Make it a smaller carburizing flame. It's all just a matter of practice and, and setting your regulators in and getting that right. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, in residential, can you make a good copper connection with that little tiny blue flame? You can. It's not going to be as good though, right? It's going to be more likely to fail over time. It's going to be more likely to fail with vibration. When you get those weird leaks, it's just like, man, that little crack popped up. Why did that happen all of a sudden? A lot of times it's because oxides were part of that joint from the very beginning and it made a weaker joint, made a weaker connection. What are your thoughts on the turbo torch? Where you just have the ascending? Yeah. And you dump it up. Uh, turbo torch. The question is about turbo torch. Um, turbo torch is known as an air acetylene swirl tip torch. Okay, so it doesn't have to be that brand. They're all pretty much the same. The way it works is, is when the, when the gas goes through the tip, it actually draws in air underneath and it swirls it together to mix it. Um, I love them as long as you understand them. They're not as hot, the flame's not as hot. It's much easier, especially for apprentices to use. I'm a big fan of apprentices learning with that torch. Here's the downside. The downside is, it's a cooler flame, but it creates more convective heat. So if you take an oxacetylene torch and you light it and you put your hand right here, it's not going to be that hot. You take a turbo torch and you do the same thing, you're going to burn your hand in two seconds because it forces a lot more convection out. And so the downside to that is if you're working in a tight space, like you would not do an expansion valve with that torch. You would not. Um, you're going to burn everything up around it. If you're going to do things like brazing in a condenser or an air handler or something like that, I, I like them, but you just have to protect the area around it. So having something like a heat shield, heat blanket, a piece of metal, something that you can protect, it's great. It's a lot less likely you're going to burn through, and it's a much easier process because it's a wider flame. So you just hold it there, heats the joint up, you add the alloy, add the rod, piece of cake, right? So I like it to get newbies comfortable with working with flame because you know new guys who have never touched a torch before, just having fire in their hand is scary enough, let alone adjusting everything. So I like it to kind of get them used to that part of it and then teach them oxidizing. What, what's the difference between uh, swirl tip? Uh, yeah, so with a, with a swirl tip flame, because it uses this swirl thing, it's basically going to give you a balanced flame. It's going to give you a neutral flame. It's going to give you this flame all the time. Um, it, it doesn't have any of that, like, it, it, again, it depends on which zone you're in, but if you're in the main brazing zone, it, you're essentially going to have a neutral flame at all times, yeah. And it's doing that by using air, the oxygen from the air, versus, you know, actually having a separate oxygen. All right, this is a big one. Most 
brazing rods that you work on, the vast majority melt at right around the 1200 degree temperature range, okay? Copper melts at right about 2500 degrees, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, so you've got a good range that you can work in before you melt the copper. You want to get that base material to between 1100 and 1300 degrees, depending on the, uh, the rod that you're using. And so this is for, uh, there's a lot of techs who have gone their whole lives not knowing this. I've seen very good technicians, very good installers who are doing this all the time. They're just, they're just dancing. And you don't need to do that. All you need to do is get your torch in. Again, protect the areas around, make sure valves are wrapped, cores are out, all that stuff. Get in there, watch the joint until it gets to, again, I, I keep saying joint, let's change it to connection. Watch the connection <laughs> until it gets to between dark cherry and medium cherry color. Okay, so you all see that up there? Yeah, this is my, my indicator's not gonna go up here. Um, between medium cherry and dark cherry color. And once it gets to cherry or bright cherry, now you're getting more in the danger zone. You still have got room, but you're getting more in the danger zone. So you wanna get it to that dark to medium cherry and then apply rod. Now sometimes it's hard to see. If you're in really bright sunlight, that can be kind of tricky sometimes and that's where you can kind of do it by feel. But you see a lot of guys testing the joint with the rod where they get a little blob on there and they just sort of, that's not a good way to brace. And the reason is, is because we want to get our solder, our brazing alloy, or whatever you call it, rod, you want to get it to liquidus, which means that you want to get it running, you want to get it running thin, you want it thinned out. And why? Why do you want to thin out the brazing rod? So it spreads, right? Do we want to just get a nice edge cap on that joint? Is that what we're trying to do? Get it real pretty on the edge? No, we want to get it in there, right? Now, once you get it in there, then you can make it pretty around the edge if you want, right? It's not that important, but if you want, it doesn't hurt. A lot of guys like it because they can tell that it's not leaking visually, and that's great. But the goal is to get it to liquidus, which means liquid. It's just a fancy Latin word. I don't know why we like to use dumb, fancy words. But we just want to get it to that face so it draws in. And you're not going to do that if you're just dripping it on the edge and you're just trying to build it up. Get it to temperature to where you can see that color change. You get between that dark cherry and cherry, apply the rod, get it all the way around. So a lot of times I, what I'll do is I'll bend the pre-bend the rod. So I've got to, you know, I'll just put a little torch on it, get it bent like that and heat it up, put it on. And I'll usually I'll start the farthest side away. So I, I get it kind of on the underside first, work it there and then move it over to the top. Um, and you know you have a good connection. At that point, if you want to stay on the edge, back it out a little bit, but all you should be doing with your torch is this in, it gets to temperature, move it out a little bit, move it around. That's the motion, that's it. And if it gets a little too hot, what do you do? Do you go like this? No, go like this, just like that, that's it. A little too, a little too cool, a little bit in. A little, oh, hey, I got a hot spot here, just move it around. And that's true of all types of brazing. Go ahead. Yeah, so, um, so, so because I've heard, like, um, especially, when I was, like, especially um, when you're using the torch, you have to keep it at a certain like, more distance from the buffer. Like, uh, someone, like, um, is that really true? Well, you want to have enough distance that you're not going to risk popping it. You know, so if you, you don't want to risk actually touching the surface because you know, you'll get like little chunks in the tip or you'll melt piece, pieces of the tip off. Um, so you want to have enough distance that you're a safe working distance. But that's really the only reason. I mean, you want to be, again, like I said, if you're working with a torch like uh, Aerosutherland, you want to be in that you know, in that range about that far away from the tip. If you get, start getting further away from that, then you get where you have a kind of an improper mix of fuel at that point. So, so that would have been a nice experience, right? The more you do it, the more you Correct. Do it. The more you do it. But again, what are you looking for? This is the thing that a lot of apprentices don't get taught. You hand them a torch, you hand them a rod, you say, watch me, and then they go to town. But when you teach them to look for that color change, pay attention to it. And if it is real bright, put on some shades, right? So you can actually see it a little bit better. That can really help. That's what you're looking for. When you're practicing with them and you have them just stick a piece of copper in the ground and they're doing it, look for that color change. Don't bring that rod in until you already know it's gonna melt. That's the, that's the trick there. Use the mirror, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and, and again, the guys get used to, this is a quick tip for the newer guys. Guys get used to using their phones for things. Do not, I've seen you guys do it. They put their phone underneath, a piece of solder drops down, destroys their phone. Yeah, that's not a mirror. When you're brazing, a mirror is the way to go. They make some mirrors that actually have little LEDs on the top. I like those ones, those can be okay. But a, a mirror, and actually my, my favorite mirror are polished steel mirrors where they actually hold up a little bit better. Or polished, I don't know if it's steel, maybe it's aluminum, I don't know. Um, but yeah, keep a mirror when you're brazing. That's a really, really good practice. 
Um, really, ideally, uh, especially if you're working inside, you should have a small bucket of water with some rags. You should have a, a small fire extinguisher of some sort. Uh, and you should have a mirror with you when you're bracing. It just keeps you safe. Again, you start to get in trouble. You've got wet rags. You've got a little fire extinguisher. That's, that's a best practice. Um, but again, watching for color. This is something that a lot of people don't realize, though. Um, have you ever had a situation where you're brazing in a compressor? And you're brazing it in, and the, and the solder will not stick. Like, it will not stick to the compressor. It just keeps bubbling off, bubbling off. And you end up getting this big ball on the compressor. What's that? It can. And here's why. Because the stubs on most modern compressors, the vast majority, are not solid copper. They are copper-plated steel. So if you use too much heat and you burn through that top little layer of copper, you're not going to see it. You're not going to know that it's gone. It's just going to stop sticking on you. And it's a major problem. So what you have to do at that point, if you ever run into this, is back off, clean it up really good, get everything really clean, and now use a flux or a flux-coated rod. Heat the actual copper side a little bit more. That'll help it draw in a little bit better. Yeah, because to your point, because if there is still copper plating on the inside, it's just not on the outside, it'll get it drawn in. Yeah, and you need to be doing that anyway. But you are going to run into it. It's going to drive you crazy, right? The other reason why people struggle with brazing, one of the biggest reasons, is they have built up a pressure in the system. So only ever braze on an open circuit. Even when you're flowing nitrogen, the circuit is still open, right? It's still flowing out. And when in doubt, Keep it open, right? Because people will say sometimes, well, how do you flow nitrogen through a compressor? How do you flow nitrogen through a compressor? You don't, is the answer. You, you don't flow nitrogen through a compressor. That last connection is not going to be done under flow of nitrogen. You're going to flow it the whole time, but then you're going to open the circuit and you're going to brace it there, right? We don't live in a perfect world here. Uh, but if, as long as it was under nitrogen for most of its life, uh, a little bit of oxygen is not going to make its way all the way in there, right? It's the oxygen we're trying to keep away. Yeah. 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 And again, um, there's actually still dispute in the industry about the quenching question. But what I say is, is leave it long enough um, that it has a chance to completely set up, right? So you don't want, again, some people say you got to let it cool completely by itself. Well, that's not realistic, right? I mean, we're working on this thing. But you want to let it, you want to let it cool down for, I, I usually say, at least 30 seconds to a minute in that range. So it's had a chance to naturally cool, get a chance to set up. Then you can cool it down, wipe that, wipe that oxide off the outside. Um, again, if you've been taught otherwise, it doesn't hurt to leave it, right? It doesn't hurt to leave it longer. You'll get some people, because even in the factory, they, they quench it quick, right? I used to have a lot of beliefs until I went to a factory and saw some of the stuff that they do there. And I'm like, well, actually, I don't know. Um, but again, a big reason why quenching was, one of the biggest reasons why quenching was an issue long ago was that when you weren't flowing nitrogen while brazing and you quench, all that inside oxide just breaks off on the inside all at once. And so for old timers, that was a bigger deal because you would actually lose the oxide and then that would cause other problems. Nowadays, it does actually make for a weaker joint in most cases. Um, go ahead. Um, is there a difference when you're doing certain raising the soil isolation? I've never really paid attention to this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, massively, massively. So, for example, um, for residential, it doesn't matter that much, right? Because we don't, most of the connections we're making are n not high temperature, not uh, super high pressure, and they're not, they don't vibrate a lot. But if you're brazing in a compressor, I would still suggest, and again, this is, you know, you guys work at a company, you do things, how, it, what you can get at the supply house, all that. So I'm not telling you, it's not like a problem, but I would suggest if you're working on the compressor, especially the discharge line, using a higher silver solder is a better idea. Silver, higher silver solder uh, has more ductility, which means that it's a more flexible solder. So it actually does, it's less likely to crack um, when there's a lot of vibration. It also flows more thin. Um, that's kind of weird when you first use it. If you use a 10 or 15% silver, it's kind of weird feeling. If you're, used to, if you're used to FOS copper, it kind of globs on you a little bit more, which, again, like we said, that may seem like a good thing, but it's actually not a great thing. It tends to just sit on the edge a little bit more. So for really mission-critical, super important connections, 
Um, I suggest using higher silver. I don't just suggest it. They all suggest Harris, Lucas, all the solder manufacturers recommend that. Uh, up to 15%. So for example, when we work in the grocery store world, where we cannot have these joints leak, we use 15% on everything. Everything gets 15% in that case. Quick note though, if you ever are working with steel or you're working with brass, if you ever run into that, and again in residential we don't very often unless some, some cases, there's some manufacturers who will have like all steel valves, for example, expansion valves, uh, electron expansion valves, that kind of thing. At that point, you cannot use a phosphorus rod. I mean, you can, it just won't work. It, you'll have all kinds of problems with it. At that point, you have to use a complete solder, solder copper mix rod, and you have to use an extra flux. My favorite way of dealing with that sort of situation, when you've got dissimilar metals, different metals, is to use a flux coated rod. They make these rods that are, they look orange or like they've got some that are pink, whatever. And on the inside, it's really high silver. This stuff is jewelry. It's expensive, like crazy expensive. 56%, 45% in that range. And then it has a flux powder coating on the outside. And so that kind of catches, catches all. Otherwise, you have to use a separate paste flux, okay? Has anyone here ever tried to uh, repair aluminum before? Anybody? It's, it's, it's not that bad. It's not that bad, so long as you have the right product, right? You cannot use anything that we normally use. And using, doing it with an oxyacetylene torch is very difficult. That's where if I'm gonna repair aluminum, I'm always gonna either use a map gas torch, basically a plumber's torch, or I'm gonna use an aracetylene turbo torch. Lower heat makes it a lot easier because aluminum doesn't change color on you. Aluminum just goes from there to not there, <laughs> right? That's how it does. Good. Uh, I might be big on for this, but um, when I'm doing uh, aluminum welding, because very rare, but when I remember I do, I will use, uh, just turn on the acceptance part of the, the torch, kind of get a little bit of that, that soot on it. And then when you adjust the flame, whenever that soot disappears, you know, it's, it's ready. Interesting. That's, I've never tried that before, so that's something I've got to try. I, I don't know either because I've never tried it before, but it sounds plausible. It sounds plausible. I don't know. Uh, if it works, it works, right? I'm very pragmatic about this stuff. I'm nerdy, but I'm also pragmatic. If it works, it works. Um, most aluminum solder, you use the flux to tell you when you're at temperature in most cases. So like the one I use all the time, solder weld, it has a paste flux that you apply on and you just watch it. And when it turns to glass, now you know you're ready and you're out. Like I've taken aluminum cans a regular Coke can, put a hole in it, and been able to solder it shut using the, the solder weld product. But you have to follow the product specific instructions. It's not like one product is the same as another when you're doing aluminum repair. You have to know what you're working with and spend 15 minutes, watch a video, read the instructions, and you'll be fine. It's not that hard. People who are super intimidated, and again, I imagine at times, because a lot of people will say, why would you ever repair aluminum? That's the dumbest thing, just get a new coil. Right? But I imagine in this market, sometimes getting stuff is pretty hard to do. Uh, and sometimes getting a client up and running may be a matter of repairing, now in refrigeration, certainly. In air conditioning, maybe not. But, but repairing sometimes might come in handy. Maybe if it's just for friends and family sometimes. You know, it's like you gotta get them through a weekend, whatever. Uh, and it's not bad as long as you have the product. Um, again, anytime you're not doing copper to copper, stop. In the words of Vanilla Ice, stop, collaborate, and listen, right? You have to make sure, that was another joke, nobody laughed. He's not a very good rapper, I admit. Um, all right, basic practices, this just, this just covers it. This isn't the best picture in the world, so don't get, don't get worked up. Um, one of the things that a lot of people, I don't want to say do wrong, but do differently than Lucas and Harris. Lucas and Harris are two of the biggest companies that make uh, brazing equipment and solder and all that. And the way both of them tell you to braze is to actually work primarily on the tube side before you move to the bell side, the connection side. And initially that doesn't seem right because you're like, well, I wanna draw it in, right? I wanna draw it in. But the reason is, is because when you start, copper is very conductive. So the heat doesn't stay where you put it. And when you put that heat on the tube side, it heats up the tube inside first, then you move to the bell side. So you wanna get the tube side hot enough and then you move to the bell side. Does that make sense? And I, I, I didn't used to do it that way. I used to focus completely on the bell side, 
and as I started changing to the tube side and then moved to the bell side, I actually do get a little better results. And you're always, I'm always pointing, again, the general rule is you point the flame the direction you want the solder to go, right? So if you want the solder to move into the connection, which is what you want, that's where you point it, start on the tube, get that kind of to the right color, and then move it to the bell side, get that to the right color, then start applying. Is it a big deal to do it the other way? No, because I did it the other way a thousand zillion times and it worked just fine. Um, and like it says here, so uh, you're, you're moving the flame back and forth, but you're not doing this, right? You're just moving it back and forth just to keep everything to temperature, very smooth, in and out, back and forth, nice and smooth, nice and smooth. Um, and you're not just applying it to the joint edge. And like we said, inspect your work with the mirror all the time, every time, every time visual, every time bubbles, every time nitrogen pressure. This is what I tell people. Don't skip any one of those steps. Every time visual, every time nitrogen hold pressure test, every time uh, do the bubble test on it. Because you will, with each of those, you will catch a significant part of it. We're going to talk more about this. But why is it important to use bubbles in addition to a standing pressure test when you do a connection? Why is that important? Because you can find a lot of smaller leaks. You can find leaks that will not show up on that pressure test within the range of your gauge. And this is something, if you guys, who here ever, you don't have to watch, people say, I, I don't watch all your videos. No one watches all of my videos, okay? No one watches all of my videos. But who here has watched? I think he does. Does he? Okay, all right, fair enough. You may be the exception in the world, okay? All right, all right. So who here has watched any of my videos before? Raise your hand. If you've watched any of them before, raise my hand. Okay, good. So some of you may have seen Bert before, all right? Bert is, uh, he's my brother-in-law. He's worked with me a long time. He's great. And he's really good at finding leaks, like really, really good. And he talks all the time about when you're putting bubbles on, you apply the bubbles on flat. It should look like glass. You don't want to spray big bubbles on your joint because now you're not going to see bubbles. You want to apply it on so it's nice and smooth like glass, and you want to use your mirror and just look for foam. You're just looking for foam. You're not looking for big bubbles. You're just looking for that little bit, and you will find leaks that you won't find almost any other way doing it that way. Uh, and so that's why you do it both ways. Use proper pressure. You do your visual first, because the worst thing, you know, you do it a bunch of connections, and you miss one really stupid giant joint in the back, connect, connection, not joint, in the back, and, uh, and now you've got to go back and redo everything, right? That's a pain in the butt, especially when you've got Armaflex pulled over already and all that. So visual first with the mirror, make sure it looks right, then move on to the next steps. Any questions about any of this? Any comments? And I like comments, too. Like, if you don't agree with me, please tell me. That's fine, because I'm probably wrong. I'm wrong all the time about a lot of things. I have teenage kids. They always tell me I'm wrong. Uh, they, I, they are the smartest people in the universe right now. They know everything about everything. Go ahead, Matt. What's the, when you're doing a pressure test, how much is it allowed to drop? Ah, good question. Percentage-wise. The ant. <laughs> Well, OK, so this, there's a good, OK. How he, the question is a good one. How much is it allowed to drop? And we're going to cover this as we go through this. But we, I just talk in flow, right? Just, I'm, trying, I'm connecting one thing to the next as we talk through this. How much pressure, nitrogen, is allowed to drop, and, and, but it's still OK, right? What's acceptable? I want to hear your opinions. Anybody have an opinion? It depends on what the temperature is. If it gets hotter or colder. If it gets hotter or colder. Does that sound right? Does nitrogen change its pressure with temperature? You kidding me? So it does. Nitrogen does change pressure with temperature. It doesn't change like refrigerant does in its saturated state where you get these big, gigantic swings. It's a small amount. But if you want to know, again, like so say you go to a house and it's the air's off and everything and it's, and it's the middle of the heat of the day and then you come back, uh, I don't know, a couple hours later and it's cooled off by 10 degrees, that will be a measurable difference in pressure drop. It will be a measurable difference. Now, how do you know? Well, we have a great calculator in the app that's free that you can put in the before pressure, before temperature, after pressure, after temperature, and it'll tell you if it was OK, like if that was acceptable range of change. Again, you're not always going to do that. And for most of what we're doing, we're only leaving it under pressure for, I mean, if you're lucky, a couple hours in most cases. In a lot of cases, it's more like half an hour, probably. And so you don't have a lot of time. Um, to see how well it holds pressure, which is where that three prong, well, really a four pronged approach comes in. Visual inspect your connection, bubble test, nitrogen pressure, and then vacuum, right? When you're pulling that deep vacuum with a micron gauge and you're watching that, that's also going to give you a really good indication. That's not the way, because some guys will say, hey, you don't test for leaks under vacuum. That's true, you don't. 
but it's a good final check. If you do all four of those and you braze properly, you're probably going to be in pretty good shape. Um, so all that to say, how do you know what the pressure is? Uh, sorry, I got off the, whether it's acceptable or not. The answer is no, there is no level of drop that is actually acceptable. We're just taking into account the inaccuracy of our gauges, temperature change, that kind of stuff. But there isn't like, well, you know, one tenth of a PSI in half an hour is okay. Well, it's not, but we also recognize that our gauges leak, our probes leak, everything has a little bit of leakage to it. And we also, you know, like you have to have actually looked at that change in pressure, which is where tools like, you know, your modern field piece, that kind of thing, when you put it into pressure test mode and you look at that delta P, you don't have to remember what it was at before. Did any of you used to use a wax pencil uh, on analog gauges? That's an old school way to do it. You take an analog gauge, pressurize it up to whatever pressure you want to do, and then you take a wax pencil and mark it on the, on the display. Yeah. It's an okay way, right? It's fine. But, but again, you just have to think about the accuracy of the gauge, right? So for you to be able to perceive a one PSI change is really tough to do with those old analog gauges. So um, the answer is, there's, it depends on how scientific you want to get, right? Because every system leaks. Every system in the world leaks at the molecular level, all right? Like even copper, uh, copper connections, at the molecular level, there is leakage that occurs if you look at it under electron microscope. But does that matter in the lifetime of a system? No. The types of leaks that we should allow are so tiny that you would never even perceive them over a 20-year life of a piece of equipment. It's just like a refrigerator, right? A refrigerator comes out of the factory, it's pre-charged, you should never need to touch it again. Right now we know that you do, and it's usually for dumb stuff, you know, plastic parts and electronics and all that, but the actual sealed refrigeration system, I mean those suckers will last 50 years in some cases. There's refrigerators out there, you know, from the 50s that are still running and have never been touched in the charge, and they do have tiny, 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 tiny molecular leaks in them, right? So how, how persnickety are we going to get? Here's the other thing, okay? Leak rate has everything to do with internal volume on the system. I know this is getting boring, but try to stick with me here, all right? Has everything to do with internal volume on the system. So if you have a small ductless system with a 10-foot line set and you are watching that nitrogen pressure drop, you're going to see that a lot. It, it could be the same size leak as a 5-ton system with a 50-foot line set, and that 5-ton system, you're not even going to perceive the difference. Why? Internal volume as a percentage of the total internal volume of the system, you're going to notice it a lot quicker on the smaller system than on the bigger system. Does that make sense? So I can't give you a rule. That's, that's what it comes down to. So when we're doing grocery stores and we've got miles of piping inside of a building, when we pull that sucker down, we'll use vacuum as an example, when we pull that sucker down to 50 microns, we could have a gusher of a leak and not know it. That's because there's, there's molecules coming in to make up that space, but we've pulled it down so low and there's so much volume that it doesn't show up quickly on a gauge. The answer is, as long as you follow the process and you're being rigorous and you're not seeing more than you know, a couple tenths of a PSI change, and again, it also depends on what pressure you're using. Some people, if you're doing VRF, VRV, you're supposed to use up to 600 PSI pressure in some cases. That's gonna show up a lot quicker. So my answer is there's not one good answer. It's, it's a lot of factors. Uh, let it equalize first because if you take it out of a truck 120 degrees and put it in a you know, 90 degree yep. average line set, they're going to get a lot of change. Mm -hmm. Let it equalize. I like to take temp just you know, put a clamp on the outdoor coil yep. on the inside, get an idea, use a, a ET chart. It really makes a difference if you're doing a pressure test all day. Yes. Like start in the morning and you finish it at 2 o'clock, whatever it is. Yep. And Temperature change, yep. Good. Correct. Correct. And you're exactly right. If you're not tracking temperature change, then you really don't know. And the longer the test, the more that makes a difference. Yeah, and I've been teaching our guys to run a vacuum before you trust the nitrogen too to make sure there's no traces in there that can affect your readings. Yeah. It can, it can make a difference, yeah, for sure. Here's the thing that hopefully will give you a little bit of confidence, okay? Um, the things that I'm going to teach you, the, that we're going to talk about today, first of all, I'm completely humble about it, meaning that if there's a better way or I'm wrong, that's fine. Like, I'm not here to tell you guys how to do your job. Uh, well, I guess I am a little bit, but not mostly, right? Like, you already are a functional business that's been around a long time, right? So it's working for you mostly. We're looking for ways that you can improve. So if something's taking you longer, well, that's not okay. We've got to talk about how to make it not longer for you, right? Um, but what I can tell you is when we first implemented 
uh, a lot of these processes at Kalos, which we did. We went from being not doing these things to doing these things. Initially, there was a lot of resistance. There's a lot of friction. Nowadays, the guys do it, and they don't even think about it. They wouldn't even think about doing it a different way. A lot of it comes down to practice. A lot of it comes down to having the right tools. But a lot of it is just mindset, right? Like It's like you have to fully commit to a way of doing things. But I'm not negating what you're saying, because it's, it's true. It's, it's something that we run into all the time. All right. Let's talk more about flowing nitrogen. Um, Honesty here. This is not a. This is there's is a no judgment zone. I work most of my career not flowing nitrogen. Okay. How many people here flow nitrogen when you brace? No judgment zone. Okay. Recently, that's fine. That's fine. Um, I'll tell you that the biggest challenge with flowing nitrogen is just getting in your own head about it, because once you get out of your head about it, you got to pull the nitrogen off the truck anyway. You're using it to pressurize. Now, for you guys here, I know you're you're. Uh, uh, legal uh, system is a little more lax, your regulatory system. So probably in some cases you might even be, have been using refrigerant to pressurize. Was that the case ever in this market, using refrigerant to pressurize instead of nitrogen? Um, it's more expensive though, so I, I know your boss is not going to be happy with you doing that anymore. But I, I, I lived through that. When I started in the trade, guys would use R22. Vapor R22 is what we used to, to pressure test everything. That was what we did. We would pressurize, we would, we would pump up our tires with it. Okay, so again, no judgment zone here. Um, not at Kalos. That was not at my company. That was a prior company, to be clear. That's how I came up. Uh, but if you're going to be pulling nitrogen off the truck anyway, that's not the issue. right? That's not what takes you longer. So what takes you longer with flowing nitrogen? I wanna, I'll ask it as a question. What takes you longer with flowing nitrogen while brazing? Yeah. But it's the order mostly. It's the order that you do things that kind of is annoying. It's just like, I'm not used to doing it this way. It's inconvenient. But if you just get used to changing your order and when you pull the nitrogen off quicker, it probably, flowing nitrogen probably adds realistically three minutes um, to an average job, maybe five ish. So, what, so, um, so in terms of that, my question is what I've raised, like, is it up there? Is it absolutely mandatory to like uh, run nitrogen to the system while I'm raising? Because I don't see like a lot of people do it. Uh, a lot of people don't do it for a couple reasons. Okay? First reason is, is that there was a whole generation who didn't do it because for the reasons that I started with, which is they worked with mineral oil. And when you work with mineral oil, it's not as big of a problem. Now, here's the reason why you can get away with it. Because you're only doing a couple connections. When you're only doing a couple connections, and again, think about it. If you open, because oxygen is the problem. Air and oxygen is the problem. So if you open those connections and you connect those tubes right away, and you don't give, because nitrogen, because the line set, a uh, new line set comes pre-charged with nitrogen. An older line set had refrigerant in it, not oxygen. And so if you could do that quick, you probably don't have that much oxygen in there. It's probably not a big deal, right? But again, probably, 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 right? Like, it's the issue, because then you just get the one where it took a while, and it was open for a while, and whatever else, and it's a new guy, and, and now the thing's just chock full, and now you have a failed expansion valve. Now again, a lot of other people say, well, yeah, but that's why you got a line dryer. That's what the line dryer's for. Oh, right, but I mean, depending on where you position the line dryer, a lot of these line dryers are actually in the condensing unit, um, factory installed, depends on the situation. It can make it, that, that cupric oxide can make it to that metering device before anything else. So is it mandatory? Well, it's mandatory if the company that you work for says it's mandatory. That's, that's the real answer. Um, but again, it is a practice thing. I would encourage people to try it. Now, here's the other reasons so that, that a lot of people don't do it. The other reasons is, is that people are like, but I don't have that nitrogen regulator. I don't have this regulator that's got the nitrogen purge flow on it, or I don't have the little glass tube nitrogen regulator. Look, you don't need it, right? If you take your nitrogen regulator and you back it all the way out, not all the way out, you don't want the handle to fall off, you back it out, and then you just barely get a, to get, I call it a gnat fart of a whisper, right? Just barely whispering out the end, that's fine. I've brazed that way all the time. Is that ideal? No, it's not ideal. It's ideal to have the right tool, right? But there's been a lot of cases where I even have the right tool, but it's giving me trouble, whatever, I can't find it. And I still do this, just, just a gnat fart of a whisper. Just, and I'll even just kind of hold it up to my ear a little bit. Again, if you have a, if you have a cantankerous uh, apprentice who just jacks it up real quick, don't hold it up to your ear. It depends on, you know, you gotta know who, you, you gotta know who you're working with here. You, you don't want any busted eardrums here. 
but you just barely want flow. Now that is after you have purged. Okay, this is a key thing. Flowing is what you do while you braze on an open system. Purging is what you do initially where you just blast it through, especially if you're going to connect to an existing line set. You want to get all that refrigerant out. You want to just, just get everything out of there, right? That also is going to end up helping you with your vacuum too, right? It's going to help break up. If there's any, the same thing is true if you're going to replace a part in a side of a condenser or anything like that. Just blasting it through there helps. It adds energy to the system. So you're just literally adding energy. It's like adding heat. It's like a different way of doing it. And it helps get the moisture out. It helps get entrained refrigerant out. All that stuff helps it get it out of there. So that way it makes all of that easier afterwards. It's going to end up saving you time in the end, right? So you purge. Then you, then you back your regular out, just set it down just a little bit, and now you're just, now you're just barely, barely flowing. Now, you are going to use more nitrogen doing it this way. So, you know, you may want to talk to everybody and make sure that everybody's okay with this. It's going to be a little bit more nitrogen, but nitrogen generally not that expensive, especially when compared to refrigerant. People tend to overthink all this stuff. Like the same thing with purging and flowing and all that. Like you can pull the old condenser out, have the copper sitting there, take and just stick a stub in and, and tape it in place and flow that way and purge that way. It's not, at this point, we're not, we're not pressurizing the system. We're just trying to get, get it purged, right? Um, and this is another thing, I don't cover this, but do um, you, you guys connect to a lot of existing line sets, I would assume? A lot of existing line sets. Have you, have you ever used uh, the pig system, like pipe wiper or um, the one that Hillmore makes to actually flush it? Um, again, that's up to your leadership. Uh, it's a neat way to make sure you get everything out. Uh, because a lot of times, see, there used to be a generation where they said mixing mineral oil and POE is like horrible. It's going to destroy the system. It's not going to destroy the system, the mix of the oils. It's what's in those old oils that are the problem. So there could be moisture, there could be sludge, there could be all this stuff. So we've taken to using either the Hillmore or the, or the pipe wiper system where you actually force a little foam piece through the lines. Uh, and that just clears it out really, really quickly. Um, but again, that's something you would have to adopt, look at. I would encourage you to just get one, just try it out, see how it goes. It's pretty cool, though, because it actually reduces the time that it takes to pull vacuum if you're having a long time of vacuum. And you'll be surprised the stuff you get out sometimes of those lines. So um, we, we, we flush? You use when, solvent, yeah. Yeah, when we're changing from an over R20 to R20. Yeah, which is, which is fine, and that's a good practice. The only downside to flush is, I, this is what I always tell people, how much do you get out of the end? Right, just pay attention. If you, and it depends on the flush you're using. Like we use, we actually use a little bit of pro flush, and then we run a pig in after it. A little, one of those little um, flexible. You, do, you guys know what I'm saying? Like pig is the right word for it. I don't know the other word. It's a, it's a projectile. You're sending a little foam bullet like through bullet, the lines, yeah. uh, and then that scrubs everything out. Um, the downside is now you know that solvent is out and it's not staying in there, and also you see how much you get out. And I watched how much I got out before. And how much we get out now, because we used to do a solvent only system, and it's like night and day. We get out so much more stuff from the line sets before we're going to go to a 410A system. So, I and mean, we do it whether it's 410A to 410A, 22 to 410A, whatever, because you just don't know what was in those old lines. Um, you want to get out everything, right? And yeah, the old oil, and again, not because oil is a problem. The oil, if it were clean, that would not be the problem. It's all the stuff that that oil contains. And that does help with evacuation time and everything else, um, if that's a problem. Again, installs usually aren't where you have issues with long evacuation times. Usually it's when you're doing a retrofit or you're doing a parts change, something like that. That's where it takes forever. And we'll talk about why that is when we get to that section. Can, can I Go say ahead. one more thing? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm a one-man company, so actually like I do the outdoor unit first because then I can connect and I can flow nitrogen and I'm still using the indoor unit. I connect the outdoor unit and then I just leave my tank connected and then I can go up and cut out the old unit and put the new one on. And so I just basically, I try to create systems where it's easy to do the right thing and it, and it makes the job go faster. So like, and I'll only pull out the, the low side straighter core. I connect to the high side. So then I'm flowing nitrogen through the high side and I've got the, sh the low side straighter out. And that's where I connect my vacuum hose and then my micron gauge goes on the high side. So like everything kind of builds into itself. So like the whole process creates a, creates a flow where I'm not like, OK, I'm taking these straighters on. Now I'm taking them back off. Now I'm connecting this. It's just like I connect the nitrogen tank one time to my unit. I flow nitrogen. Then I pressure test. Then like I already have that. I connect my vacuum pump. 
and then I'm pulling a vacuum. Like it's yeah. all just one thing. And, and, and for us, it's not that we don't understand the process. Our limitations here are time. Time is everything here. Time right. is money. Right. So um, if you don't have the time, you tend to, I, mean, I don't want to use work. Right. But yeah, process. Right, sure. No, I, I understand that completely. I mean, again, we, a lot of people imagine that we're some kind of like utopia company where everything's perfect and everybody does everything that I say, and that's not true. Um, we are a production changeout shop. We do changeouts in a day with two people all the time. Uh, so we know what that is. In a lot of cases, especially if you're doing an attic job, getting the air handler, getting on the air handler early is about not being in a super hot attic. Um, you want to get it done in the morning so that way it's not as hot. There's a lot of reasons to do those things. What Matt is saying, and I think it's valid, and he brings that perspective. I bring the perspective of an owner of a big company who was a technician. Matt brings the perspective of a one-man guy who's doing it himself uh, right now in a very similar market, a high humidity uh, market with a lot of attic units and that kind of stuff. Um, the point here is, is do make a system that works for you, but integrate these processes. A lot of times you're going to find that a, a switch in the order of how you do things makes a big difference. And that's something that I'm not going to be able to dictate to you guys, nor would I even want to. But brainstorming about that can be really helpful and can help make things simpler. Because again, for installers, one of the biggest things is you want to get home at a reasonable hour, right? Like you do not want that install to keep stretching on and on and on. You want to get out of there. And so having an optimized process is really key there. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, hvacrschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex by Tex.